So today we're going to talk about operating room implications for CDM. And as always, uh, there's a disclaimer that everything uh, is, is copyrighted by the AMA for CPT codes, rev codes are the AHA, and this is current as of today. Today we're going to talk about charge capture process in the OR, and it's a little bit different than a normal charge capture. We're going to talk about the preference cars, and they can be a pro or a con talk about some mapping issues that we consistently find between the CDM and different modules that result in erroneous charges or a lack of charge. Look for high cost items of leakage and then, you know, using software. Our objectives today is to understand the overall OR charge capture process. So what is it? Not only the CDM, what's the whole process? Identify mapping considerations, be able to state why preference cards have this role, and every OR nurse is going to say, well, Bill, that's kind of self-explanatory. Well, I, maybe I'll have a little bit different idea when I'm done. Understanding uh, coding and supply implications. So when we look at this, the charge capture flow in an OR is very different than a clinic or, uh, you know, an ER. There are a lot of steps that have to be done before the periop experience. And one of those steps is eligibility and authorization. More and more, our uh, insurers want an authorization for a procedure. They generally do not auth all the procedures. They take the highest one, they, they do that. So if the physician um, changes the procedure during the operation, obviously we're gonna need another authorization. So that's uh, the pre-op phase. Then it goes, we have supply module. A lot of times the preference cards are linked to this. Um, there's a supply model match implant log. So we will go to the implant log when we audit and say, okay, what actually was implanted? The implant log is that source of truth. And then what other supplies are, are there? Sometimes the implants actually have the wrong C code on them. So when you look at the make, the model, and the serial number, you're able to determine what the right one was. Then it goes to the OR module where the preference cards and implants are there and time-based charges. So you've got, at this point, you have three different modules. That OR module then links to a couple different things, the EMR and the pick list. That comes over then to OR billing. And this is, this is where it's drastically different from the rest of the house. The house charges, if you do a procedure, a lack repair, you charge a lack repair. If you get a splint, you charge a splint. The OR charges by exception because these pick lists have a number of items on there that the physician feels is, is uh, necessary for the performance of the procedure in a quality fashion. So they, charge only what they didn't use. So it's a complete reversal of what we're, our mind thinks. Normally we charge what we do. This one, we're charging the things we didn't use. Those charges that were then uh, said were used go to the CDM along with time-based pr uh, procedure charges. And so that is the OR flow. You're in a, uh, a registration module you're in insurance verification areas, surgical scheduling, uh, you've got a supply module, you've got OR module, OR billing module, and CDM. So you have a lot of touch points where this can go wrong. Let's start with surgery scheduling. The number one cause, according to RevCycle Intelligence, says about 25% have failed demographics. Um, HFMA has varied on this number, but I just took a, an exam with them last weekend. And in the exam question was it's up to 40% of claims have to be reworked because the demographics are wrong. So that's because people change insurance quite a bit. If they should change insurance and your authorization was with the prior insurance, you kind of have to start over with eligibility and authorization. So surgery scheduling now becomes the first control point to make sure the eligibility is current and the, there's uh, 
if there's a lack of authorization or it's incomplete, they're going to have to stop right then and there and say, I need this off. It has to be done for the most expensive, extensive procedure, must be date specific. And this is where authorizations fail all the time. Most payers only honor the authorization on the date of service they gave it for. So if the surgery is supposed to be on 8-1 and you do it on 8-2, you don't have a valid auth. So you need to be careful of that date. And it needs to be confirmed again before the patient gets into the room. So when you go to the pre-op holding area, we need to see the eligibility and the auth, the date of service, and, and that that auth matches what's actually being done. So these failed demographics are a huge component in avoidable denials and write-offs. The OR desk needs to confirm that the authorization has been obtained and recorded prior to the procedure. Now, little unknown thing, physicians will get an authorization from the payer for the services they're going to render with that patient. However, not all payers accept the physician auth. Many payers require the hospital to, or ASC or somebody who's going to be the, the facility version to get their own authorization. So a lot of times when I see denials, they'll say we have an auth, but it wasn't for the hospital. It was for the physician. If no authorization is required, and there's a list that they that they people know how to do in, in uh, registration surgery scheduling, go to the payer, look for the list. If it's not required, then no nurse authorization nurse need uh, sorry authorization nurse needs to actually take part and and follow up on that. If it you have to determine it's current for the date of surgery, and I can't stress that enough. When I was a, a, a VP for a system. We had a significant issue with two payers that denied all the offs because they were either done before the day before, the day after. So it's a it's a big issue, and you need to work with your uh, staff to make sure it's that day. So we can no longer, and, and if you've listened to my lectures lately, I've taken a turn to the left. I used to talk about just charge capture. And we can no longer ignore the fact that reimbursement is shrinking. We were paid reimbursement based on the volume of services we used to perform. So if you did a test, you got paid. Did a surgery, you got paid. Now it's more bundles, it's more containment, and we're seeing a deflator now to, to the margins. So when we look at this, the question is, well, why are we in this problem? Well, we've been in this problem for quite a long time. Um, you look at the national expenditures, they're going up and up and up. And if you look way back to 2019, this dates before COVID, and I, want, I made a point of doing this before COVID, we were such an outlier then in charges uh, per capita. So obviously charging is the benchmark for medical services in the US, but are they really what's driving the margin? And more and more, we're starting to see that answer is not. So spending's an all-time high. We now have post-pandemic influences, such as getting restarted, getting the, uh, the processes back in place, bringing people back in the building. We have uh, current additions in digitalization. We see a shift to telemedicine. So we're seeing a lot of post-pandemic influences. And if it hasn't been said yet, most facilities didn't like the way it went down with this pandemic. So they're actually starting to think about how they would handle the next one that, is, that could occur. Um, price transparency is also driving that charging because people are starting to compare hospital X to Y to the ASC. Where, what's the best bang for my buck? Because we have more and more high deductible plans where patients pay more. The charge description master in many hospitals also contains cost accounting items and a change to the cost description master. And there, most employee uh, facilities are starting to employ accounting software. So. What is the change in 21? The pandemic showed us that we still have to make sure that we get all the root causes of the leakage, charge leakage remediated, but 
we now need to control the costs associated with patient care. Now, this has been stated for a while by most payers. Many of the charges are not reimbursable, but the cost still exists. So if you overutilize supplies that are not reimbursed, those are costs in the actual procedure cost that don't get reimbursed. So you're going to slower that margin. Right now, pre-pandemic, I think it was Price Waterhouse, don't quote me, but I think it was Price Waterhouse said that pre-pandemic, 24 to 25% of all hospitals had a negative profit margin. Post-pandemic, in a pessimistic view, it's going to be 49.1% or almost 50%. The rural hospitals are going to be affected, as are the system. Uh, facilities are now starting to look at controlling practice patterns and supply chain. So those are in group purchasing or more supply chain management. It's taken a real focus from materials management to be a real art using technology and data and data analytics in that supply chain. So the new definition is still charges less cost as your revenue, but charges reviewed are going to be for lost charges, what we forgot to charge. So maybe we charge your procedure we forgot to charge OR time. So we definitely want to get that in there. But we're going to start looking at overutilization. This is not new. Way back in 2020, when OPPS became a thing with Medicare, they started putting this in every final rule about packaging and the OPPS packaging encourages hospitals to effectively negotiate with manufacturers and suppliers to reduce the purchase price of items and services, explore alternative group purchasing arrangements. So way back in the day, they're talking about the purchase price of, of supplies. Similarly, packaging encourages hospitals to establish protocols that ensure the necessary services are furnished while scrutinizing the services ordered by practitioners to maximize the efficient use of hospital resources. So now we start to see the involvement of lab utilization teams where they look at the pre-op and they say, do you need all those laboratories? You just need a pro time for everybody or you only need a pro time on somebody who exhibited that. We're starting to see, you know, younger people, not it used to be the day they got an EKG and a chest x-ray, now no more. So we're starting to see a change in the practice patterns. Also, hospitals are really starting to look at those uh, implants and devices and saying, is, the, is this one with all the bells and whistles, is this the one we need or could we have gotten by with the old tried and true? So OR charge capture, there are four things you can charge for, and no matter where you are in the hospital. Procedures, which are going to be coded by HIM, services such as evaluation and management, labs, radiology, things like that, pharmacy, and then supplies. And in the cases, the CDM must contain a line item to charge for every one of these four components. And the, in some, there's a CPT code, and the claim might miss the revenue earned. So um, you need to be able to say that you have a CDM line for this. So what happens when you do a new procedure? Do you get the CDM line item or you don't add it until you've done 20 of them and you're using a miscellaneous charge? If you're using miscellaneous, <coughs> who's checking to make sure it went in correctly? If I just take this and we're going to focus on supply, they represent the largest percentage of the institution cost to provide services, hands down. Pharmacy is a close second, though. They're seldom separately reimbursed. Preference cards that are not accurate, current, or contain correct supply information will translate into lost charges or overcharges. And supply items not in the CDM but on the preference card can lead to systemic systematic failures. So, for example, we don't update the preference card, but um, it's still linked to a supply, and that supply has changed in the CDM. When I start looking at root causes, I did a preference card literature review. And um, the, uh, Cardinal Health had quite a lot to say about this. Um, supplies make up 20% of the hospital expenses. Cardinal Health found previously the supply chain loses $5 billion in high-value medical devices. We're not talking about screws. We're not talking about guide wires. We're talking about high-value pacemakers and implants. I recently had a client where there had a procedure for a, um, a joint implant 
on the claim. I mean, the joint implant was on the claim. It was in the OR module. It was in the implant log. But because of all these interconnectivities between the module, it the procedure never flowed over to the bill. So this is part of the problem. Um, the cost continued to rise and the margin uh, for inaccurate charges continues to grow. And I already said $5 billion, but what's more importantly, preference card contain 20 to 40% more supplies than they're actually required for a given case. So if you don't use the 20 to 40%, are you crediting it? Is it ending up on the bill? So what they did is they did analytics and they found out that it's reported as 50 to $150 per case. This is cost, but unused supplies. However, one study found for neurosurgery could be as much as 968 per case. So these supplies on these preference cards that are not used over and over and over again need to come off the preference card. So we're not pulling them and we pull them as a physician. Now, anybody that's been in an OR does not want to deal with the surgeon. Uh, the surgeon's focused on the procedure. When they ask for something, there's an expectation somebody's there with a hand to give it to them. So a lot of these things are on there for what I call a guarantee. Guarantee against physician getting upset that something's not there. Supply changes daily with items, makes, models, upgrades. So I use the UNSPC, the United Nation uh, Supply Procedural Coding. It, it shows you categories. OR spends considerable time managing the supply chain, but they do a lot of it still in, in charging. OR charging is still done manually. So it's essential that supply utilizes, in fact, that was coded and charged. So if I look at the supply chain for the OR, I have this pick list in the middle, but purchasing is touching it, inventory controls part of it, mapping to the OR module is part of it, mapping to the CDM is part of it. So when I look at this, there are four different touch points that have to go as planned. That means if you update the pick list, one of these four or all of these four need to be updated. Mapping between the modules is where I find most of the money missing um, for OR. Um, where we have an OR module, we thought it was charging through the OR module and the, the number wasn't there to connect it to the CDM or it connected to the wrong CDM item. Um, more and more barcoding and RFID is being used um, for the newer supply chain systems, but a lot of people are still on those tags that uh, stickers. <clears throat> RFID are like the enabled supply cabinets, and they really have the highest degree of success, followed by barcoding. Um, now, when you purchase packs, there are a number of billable items within the pack, but usually I see a charge for a pack, and that pack needs to explode into the billable C codes uh, within the pack or you don't represent your charges correctly. Um, goal is to minimize theft and loss um, from open but not utilized. Um, both barcoding and RFID does it. You can leave it in the container and, and pull it out really quickly for the circulating nurse. Uh, getting them to connect to the item as a preference card is a first step. So you have to actually do a map. What's the number on the preference card? What does it connect to? What is the billing number it's connected to? Because you know the billing number is not the CDM number. Then take the billing number and go to the CDM. This is essential to ensure that proper charge is placed on the claim in the proper amount. Due to the volume of items and item models, they're changing generally handed by supply chain. Well, now we're starting to see more and more where there are supply coders. People who are experienced in supply fix coding, they're part of the supply chain. So they take the make, the model, the purchase order. They ask the vendor for what the code is from them. They make sure that it's uh, their coder, certified coders are gonna look and see that that's the right thing and put it in. Um, However, this is the rare, rare trend. This is the new evolving trend. Most supply chain do not have anyone that is familiar with HixPix coding. So if they're putting the code on, they're picking one which may or may not be correct. So the CDM will need experts who come from supply chain, have the ability to research and find the most correct code. 
And so that is one of the biggest keys to success. We're starting to see CDM supply specialists. All they do is manage the supply charge master portion. And if you're looking at a charge master, we get charge masters all day for review and CDM reviews. I may see uh, six, uh, 8,000 procedure lines, uh, 16,000 um, pharmacy lines, and then 199,000 supply items. So a lot of the old mechanism was to put a supply in the CDM for inventory maintenance, but we never took it out when we stopped using it. So there's a lot of clutter. CDM team has to have personnel who can manage the coding, the level charging and the supply coding. Uh, many claim edits match the supply Hicks picks code. So many edits, so for example, Revenue Guardian and Vital Integrity, these edits will stop the claim before it goes out and say, you know what, you have a C1776 joint implant on this claim, I have no, you have no procedure. Or you have a procedure for a hip joint replacement and you have no C1776. So now we're starting to see artificial intelligence, rules are being built of uh, A to B or one to many to start to catch this. Most of these edits, trigger because the supply coding was done inaccurately. So therefore it's inaccurate on the claim. I cannot tell you the number of times I have seen a single chamber pacemaker uh, come across on the bill because of the code when they actually put in a dual chamber rate responsive because the CDM mapping was outdated. So if you look at the OR and the CDM, let's talk about that. There has to be this internal mapping. Now, who's in charge of the mapping? As a general rule, either the OR IT team or the patient financial services IT team or IT themselves. The question is, did they really able to recognize what that supply item is from the purchase uh, section all the way through to the OR pick list and then onto the bill and make sure that it is the same item. We're also seeing that uh, more CDM team needs to be current and accurate, requires a team that is actually within surgical scheduling and saying, you know what, this authorization for this CPT code, I do not see it in the CDM. I called HIM and they don't know what level to put it in. Can you help me? Um, finance and reimbursement, definitely for the pricing. The CDM team needs to be uh, very very experienced in coding. Supply change is part of it, and then IDT to link these things. OR lines within the CDM have to be set up uh, for a number of different components. First of all, we have the OR levels or procedure codes, individual codes. It depends on what facility and what your culture is, whether you want OR levels or procedure codes. But if you use levels, what I tend to see is the levels are made up and they were made up in 2005 and nobody's touched it since then. Yet healthcare has evolved. So these levels have to be reviewed at least yearly to say, is this capturing what we want? I'm starting to see levels plus concept where there are levels based on the procedure, but then there's a plus concept, a plus for adding equipment in the room, a plus for adding more nurses, a plus for adding perfusion, whatever it is, these plus concepts that um, actually pull it up a level. So maybe it was a level three, now it's a level four. Um, PACU, frequently there are procedures done like uh, ECT for behavioral health, done in the PACU because you have to sedate them, manage an airway, anesthesia is there, but there is no procedure card set up in the PACU. So they charge PACU time. PACU time doesn't go to the HIM coding module. It's not in Revenue Code 360. So your PACU has to have all the procedures that they do set up. Anesthesia, obviously 370, but you use, why just charge a flat fee? Many anesthesia comes in um, general, inhalation or regional or epidural spinal or max standby. So levels for that we see. OR levels also according to a mechanism. And what is that mechanism has to be defined in a policy? The number of nurses in the room, the equipment included, the RVU weighted the procedure and others. So when you do your levels, make sure there, there's a data analyst part of this. And sometimes even a statistician to say, okay, I'm so many standard deviations away from where I wanna be. Anesthesia is very important. People keep forgetting that because if the anesthetist goes outside of the department, 
and does like uh, uh, max standby or does uh, sedation with airway management for an MRI or CT scan, they forget to charge it because it's out of the department. So we definitely have an out of the part department charging issue. And so you want to set up some sort of mechanism in the CDM to have your out of departments. It's all in 370, it's usually packaged, but there is a requisite cost to provide those services. And as, as CMS has repeatedly said, costs that represent a resource utilization need to be represented in a charge and placed on the claim. So if you keep not downgrading uh, anesthesia and there's costs for this, you need to go ahead and, and start to look at this in a different way. There's usually no requirement for HICS, PICS, or CPT code for hospital billing. Professional billing, you use the 10,000 CPT code series. Pharmaceuticals can be charged under revenue code 250, 636, or 370. I frequently see patients who are charged for an entire bottle of sevoflurane raw, the bottle, the liquid, that gets poured into the anesthesia machine that results in inhalation services. Those inhalation services may only be used on one patient or that bottle may last four patients. When you're charging for the inhalation agents, your best recourse is to charge to have pharmacy charge the cost in an intercom company journal entry over to the Department of Anesthesia and make sure that that cost is displayed in your anesthesia minutes. Otherwise, you have to do a whole complex type of formula on inhalation, expiratory rate, absorption rate that the anesthesiologist got to do, but they're not going to do that for every patient. It's just simpler to put the cost in your minutes. Um, and we just talked about that. Um, Charges are generally per minute and they based on the time that anesthesia personnel began any care. So what I see commercial payers always do is your anesthesia time has to match your OR time or we're not going to pay that. That is not correct. That is not something you should let go. Anesthesia time begins at the first presentation where the anesthetist provides anesthesia services, whether that is inserting lines or uh, ins ensuring hemodynamics are there. <clears throat> and then they come in the room. Well, that a lot of people have, a lot of facilities have induction rooms where the, there's an anesthetist that does all the pre-induction stuff so that when they come into the room, you're ready to go. It's not a long thing. You do your time out and away you go. So you want to make sure that that time that, that the anesthetist was there to the time they actually signed them into the PACU, that's the anesthesia time. And it may, it's going to be longer than OR time. So let's move over to OR levels, which is your service revenue. And you can do an individual line based on description. A revenue code has to be there of 360 or 361. I don't like 361 minor surgery too often. I see that used throughout the CDM for, for uh, bedsides and what have you. 761 treatment rooms better. The reason I'm saying this is when you go to do your cost report, if you have 361 for all these minor procedures, you're going to dilute your ratios. You want that ratio to be as robust as possible on your cost report. And for that, I use 360. Um, there's never a CPT or Hicks PIX code because that's going to be soft coded based on the documentation. The CDM line for the OR level allows the code to be applied for the coding professionals. Then, then the HIM module has something to attach it to. OR levels are time-based, and I frequently see time in 30-minute increments or hour. I mean, and you don't go the hour. So what I like to see is a front load for setting up the room, getting everything in there, the non-separately reimbursable supplies uh, that are used on all cases like sheets, gloves, Microsoft covers, EKG leads, things like that, and a tracheal tube. All of that um, goes in your first 15-minute charge. And then after that, um, I, I kind of like per minute because then you won't ever have to fight with your commercial payer about your OR level time because they will come back and say, well, you had two hours and 36 minutes from room to room for or table to, to, to out time. And you're charging a whole different amount. So I like to do the minutes because of the fact 
that it's it's easily identified to your payers. Um, but you can do whatever you want. Um, Procedure-based CDMs in the OR are something I tend to see more in the ambulatory surgery areas where they do a limited list of procedures and they want it hard-coded and the physician assigns the code. Um, this is a whole separate thing where you'd actually put in the CPT code and the weight and what have you. The preference is absolutely to have HIM uh, code it based on the uh, materials in the uh, medical record. Um, and it doesn't time-based. This one, you're going to get a flat fee for the procedure. The supply pick list, you have to reconcile that with the supply chain. Pick list should be reviewed with the surgeon to alleviate potential items that are not necessary at the time of the case or, re or frequently. So sit down and say, this is your preference card. Is this still accurate with you? And if they just say yes as they're walking out the door and never look at it, ask the question again. Um, one of the issues is these pick lifts tend to take a life of their own on and live in perpetuity. So I recently went through working with a hospital where they did a conversion to a new OR system and they brought the pick lifts over. And I said, did you review them? Well, no. Well, when they reviewed them, they found that they weren't even close to current and they had to start over again. So these pick lists have to re be reviewed at least twice a year. Um, they create a source of costs for supplies that are not utilized. So get those things that aren't used on every case on a separate table and make it an ancillary pick list. Um, they have to be reconciled to make sure the matches in the, to the CDM. And that's the other thing I see is that it doesn't match the CDM. Um, and the Hicks fix code must be current. OR is a department where high cost supply and devices reside. So you've got your pacemakers, you've got your joint implants, you've got some heavy screws, you've got neurostimulators. Um, these are high cost. And I always make sure that these are actually tracked through the entire CDM to a fake bill. So I make a patient up uh, John Smith, mom, whatever, and I create a bill. I charge it all the way from the pick list, the implant log, whatever you're doing it from, all the way, and I look on the bill and say, did that come out correct? Did it come out with the right Hicks picks code? Did it come out with the same data service? And did it come out in the right quantity? I have frequently seen screws where for whatever reason, the quantity are hundreds, and, and that's not going to fly to a payer. Um, neurosurgery uh, stim neurostimulators, there should be one. There shouldn't be four or five uh, pacemakers. Um, so you got to look at how these things do because a lot of times in the billing module, if they're pulling over from one module like the OR module and then there's another CDM line that it pulls to, you may get one from the original OR module and one from the CDN, you get two on the bill. So you have to match the implant log to that bill. Here's an example of a device lookup, make and model. So as we see, there's all these C1721 and C1722, but I need to know when I go in the implant log, I have a Bellows VR cardio defibrillator sing cham single chamber made by Biotronic, Bion and it's got a model number 342873. And that I previously had as a C1721, which was a dual chamber, but I need C1722. So I do make sure for all the devices that are in Revenue Code 278 that you have a, a lookup. Now, this is also one of the issues you have to be extra careful with the Epic system because they use shells. Here's an example of a knee joint by make and model. Uh, these are Zimmer and Zimmer has a whole bunch of them um, with model numbers. The PACU we talked about tends to be represented by a time-based methodology similar to the OR. And, you know, one of the things when I'm auditing it, I find that the PACU time, there's a lapse between the OR table when they leave the table, OR out time, and the PACU in time of 10, 15 minutes. It's like, where did they go? 
Um, so it's very important that those approximate each other. Uh, CDM will have time-based lines using 710 in a charge, and it doesn't have a hix fix because it's considered package services. Um, PACU also serves as a medical unit. We talked about that for minor surgery and electroconvulsive therapy. I see PACU a lot of times used um, when, a, like they call it pick line day, where they ha do a lot of pick lines at once um, because they have the radiology there. <clears throat> It's essential that the CDM meets with the PACU team and ensures that any procedures, not just recovery services. So I recently did a CDM review and I asked them, other than recovery, what do you do there? Oh, we bring patients down for bedsides. We do, uh, we'll, we'll do all sorts of incision and drainage for wound care. And we went and looked and these services were never charged out. So it represented a charge loss. So CDM has to consult with HIM to get an abstract of anything performed in the PACU that they coded. It also lends itself to time-based minor procedure charges with 761 and again, 361 instead of 710. Because why would you use recovery room, which is packaged, when you need to have it separately reimbursed for the procedure? So you want 361 or 761. And a lot of times I'll see it come through with 710 and then it doesn't hit the edits right and the payment isn't, isn't correct. So as we get close to closing today, um, cost is a huge issue right now. And so when we're looking at the OR charge master, I'm going to really look at those cost concerns. What can I do to make sure that those things that cost us are represented, represented correctly and are current? Um, the first priority for reimbursement is to achieve the eligibility and the authorization. And that is a huge loss and a huge cause of denial. Granted, it doesn't do the OR charge master any good, but if you haven't gotten the proper auth and eligibility, uh, none of that OR charge capture process can take place. Complex interactions between patient access, EMR, supply chain, OR module, charge master, billing, they create many, many, many opportunities for mapping failures. And as a result, I see things on the bill that nobody ever expected. And the reason being is that the auditors don't tend to go ahead and audit the record against the chart. And you need to do that. So I see it in neurosurgery the most where they actually do audit the record uh, they audit the chart, they make sure that everything is there. Sometimes in cardiothoracic surgery, I seldom see orthopedics account for things. The implant log is that thing that auditors are gonna go to. So if that implant log does not match what came out on your bill, you have to look for where it went wrong. So um, also you have to work as one team with supply. Um, because they now have the bigger portion of the cost aspect, not only for the hospital, but for the uh, OR. And these costs get turned into charges. And if your charges are so far in excess of your competitor down the street, hospital price transparency is beginning to show that. And so it shows, and, and when hospitals negotiate with payers, I've had uh, payers say, I don't wanna negotiate with them, even though they have a great program, I don't wanna negotiate with them because they're the high cost alternative. I can get the same quality at a lower cost. So we really need to start looking at our charges and our costs in a whole new way. It used to be, I want more volume because then I get more reimbursement, then I get more bottom line. Well, as the shrinkage is occurring with bundled payments and, and a, a, the experimental payment programs and packaging with both OPPS and the payers and case rates uh, coming down, you really need to look at how can I maintain that margin? And the best way to maintain it is to maintain your CDM, your pick list, as well as your mapping. The mapping's essential. Um, so you have to look at, I don't, I, I mean, it would be sad to hear you're one of those hospitals where the device shows up on the bill. I've had another hospital that went through an OR module conversion recently um, from one brand to another and all the uh, all the, 
the pacemakers were coming through as dual chambers. They were all dual chambers. Every single one of them was a dual chamber. And for whatever reason, that when they converted it over, they only built one. So all of these supplies, like uh, pacemakers, went to the one charge line. So you really need to look at that because that's not only going to be a denial, it could be considered fraud and misuse, or you're going to lose the charge altogether. And you know, then it's very hard to get a payer to pay after you never put it on the bill in the first place. Um, CDM is still essential in putting the charges through without a properly functioning CDM. You have no capability of getting those charges on the bill. So it still is the aorta of the hospital reimbursement system. And again, more and more, we need to start seeing edits in place. Those could be an epic, they could be a, uh, uh, analyzer, revenue guardian, they can be vital integrity, but basically you need edits so that the, the revenue integrity team can look at the perioperative experience in total and see things. And one of the things I see that I didn't bring up a lot here are late charges. Now you remember the charges stay, are you have an open period after the procedure to get your charges on. They're called min days. And once that uh, is coded by HIM, if you've left supply charges off, that's, that's too bad. That's a late charge. It's not going to go on the claim. And it, the claim's gone. It's all out. Then there is a determination, a business decision made on whether that late charge is relevant enough to go ahead and rebill it because there's a 35 to $100 charge to rework it and rebill it. So the goal here is to minimize late charges and the OR is one of those areas where late charges tends to be a consistent issue. So you have to look at the root cause. Why do I have late charges? Is it one service line? Because the docs aren't, aren't, aren't getting you what you need. What are those late charges about? Um, is it because I put a purchase order in for a consignment vendor and they didn't give me the code that I could get it in the CDM? If so, if you know that that's gonna happen, you need to call the billing office and tell them to put a hold on that claim, a do not bill, until you get these items. You definitely don't wanna leave off an implant. So at this point, Marie, I'm, I've, we've got plenty of time for questions, which is unusual for me. Um, would we like to start the Q&A process? Marie? I'll start it, let's see. What's the markup factor you typically see industry-wide applied to supplies? Well, there is all sorts of markup factors. So you see one markup factor in the fact that they used to be our highest volume supplies are gonna have the highest markup each year. And so we're gonna make up revenue by marking them up to 8% or whatever. So we use the, the volume to create something. And over time, those markups add on and on and on, and you have this extremely high markup. Um, so what I actually see are very strategic now. They do strategic pricing, so there isn't one markup. There usually is a tiered markup system based on the cost. So things that cost X to Y will be marked up this, Y to Z. So I, I do see that, but basically it's strategic pricing. Um, how many times do you see meals for visitors and slipper charge? Well, I've been at this about 20 years and you just, we were the first. Um, these are patient convenience items. They belong on an itemized bill and charged to the patient. Um, these are not covered by any program. They should not be on a bill that goes out the door. And if they go on, they have to have revenue code 990 um, and do that. But basically, if it's for that peri-op or recovery room, that should be in your minutes and those costs should be there. I, I certainly don't think that cafeteria is part of the OR perioperative experience. Um, and if it's meals for a patient, or liquids for a patient, that's usually in included in phase two recovery charge. So I don't see that, um, but I'm also speaking from a position of weakness here because I don't know what your charging mechanism is. 
And so you may be getting it through correctly. So I have no way of knowing uh, whether that is or that isn't correct. Um, Can you hear me now, Bill? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened. Um, there is another question in the Q&A panel now. Yeah. So what is the industry standard for charging supplies with cost less than a typical certain amount? We have an industry standard that all CFOs prescribe to, and it's called a low dollar threshold. And so they basically decide for the entire hospital, what is the low dollar amount? So it's based on the cost. And so they'll say things that cost less than $5, $10, $25, whatever they decide is appropriate, we are going to not charge them separately. And we're going to put them in the price in a bundle payment uh, for like the room rate or the OR time or whatever. So there is a policy. It has to be a written policy for low dollar threshold. So that's that's across the board. Most CFOs do that. Can you speak to pros and cons of using static supply costs? Um, so obviously with the static, Brian, uh, with the static supply cost, um, you have to look at how often are you going to update your CDM and your charges? So the cost, the dynamic supply cost, the cost can fluctuate up and down. But one of the concerns that comes out of that is that the CDM doesn't update its charges. So if you have a cost that's escalating and it continues to escalate in a dynamic fashion, then your charges are not appropriately set. So I do like the dynamic supply cost. More and more people are using that now with our RFID and with barcoding, the supply cost. The key here is that you need to make sure that finance is involved in the charging component. Um, the, also, the, the dynamic supply cost also allows you to pick the better vendors and GPOs. So if you see one vendor continues to up their prices, you may be looking for another. So I do see that more and more. Um, and if I don't answer your question, just put it back. You didn't answer it. I need more. <clears throat> Charging with surgical levers for more than one procedure. Does each procedure get a different charge or time? It's time. You charge the m highest weighted procedure in the best level, and then you add on time. Um, so for example, you may do a uh, cardiac bypass, okay? That's a high level, like a level five. And at the same time, you decide, I know this, I'm just making this up out of thin air. You decide you're gonna put in a dual chamber pacemaker. That's a lower level, you're gonna add on time. So that's, um, that's kind of where you are with the levels. I, I, it's usually time. You can do different levels with different charges, but the problem is in the end result on the bill, you have to roll 360 revenue code together. So the charges are gonna have to roll, which might make extra work for the biller. So it's really up to the billing how they wanna do it. Um, is it possible charge for any reusable OR supplies? Well, they're, they're, this is an ongoing discussion. Uh, they call them reposables. And if they have a disposable element, then you charge for the disposable element, like a tip or something like that. You never, ever, ever charge for equipment separately. That goes in the price of your procedure. So no equipment charges. And so because it's between equipment, at, which is uh, on your cost report as a depreciable asset and on your balance sheet as an asset that gets depreciated, um, you don't really charge equipment. So the reposables, all you could possibly do is charge for the cost of the re-sterilization and processing. And most hospitals have moved to disposables, but where I see reposables are in the EGD lab where they use the same scope over and over and over again. And there's a, uh, there's a charge for sterilization and cleaning. Um, is there a harm charging for DMI items when you have no DME license? and are not billing them separately as DME. Uh, I, I think, Kay, that's more of a compliance question. Uh, I'm not, I can give you a little guidance, but it's certainly you need to bring it up with your compliance officer. DME items that are provided without the expectation of a charge is therefore an inducement, uh, an incentive. 
and you must get the DME and put it on the bill or send it to a DME supplier for them to charge it. So it would be a problem to charge out DME. So what I see ORs doing, like uh, they send the patient with a, a specialty knee immobilizer that's DME. It's not a prosthetic or orthotics, it's actually a specialty DME. They have a DME cabinet and they basically have a prescription written by the surgeon and the medical necessity and they give the demographic sheet and then the DME provider bills it out. Um, over the years, our prices on some hard-coded procedures have increased by percentage points over the years. With price transparency now a thing, our charges seem high compared to a few area hospitals, but of course reduced substantially. Um, well, can you make significant changes? <clears throat> this is really a contract issue. Um, many uh, contracts say you cannot increase or change your price more than X percentage um, in, a, in, a, in a calendar year. So for example, you find you've undercharged for something and you want to increase it 20%, but you have a cap of 4% for your CDM. So this is a contract modeling issue. This is contract management and let them see how you can uh, re-equilibrate that. This is a big question that's coming out of HBI. Um, can we reduce our costs? <clears throat> and the question then becomes, what have you contracted to do? So for Medicare, um, your costs and your charges have always supposed to represent your consumption. So your resource consumption. So if you've overvalued it according to your resource consumption, Medicare doesn't care if you reduce your costs. Uh, Medicaid, I don't think would care either, but your commercials, you have a contract with them to keep your charging practices stable. So that's the issue you're gonna have to look at. And now there's some sort of thing here that a, a cochlear implant. Um, do you have any, why, Kathy, what's about the cochlear? Are you just giving us helpful tips on that? Um, okay. Uh, Adriel, uh, Cornell, let's see. Oh, wait, wait where did everyone go? Um, I can look and see. Oh, this is the cost for uh, reposables. Um, this is the cost of, you know, what your cochlear parts and accessories are. So you, you get all these different L codes that you bill. So thank you for that. Uh, next question um, is, do you have guidance to share related to knowing whether to classify a typically self-administered drug integral to a procedure? Instead, the guidance is vague. Yeah, it's been vague. Uh, my dratic drops. So basically, if you're going to use it on all procedures and it, you cannot do the procedure safely without it, then I would absolutely say that you need to include it in supply. Um, I mean, they've, they've given examples of bacitrace in which quite as flunky, but if you're gonna use um, a self-administered drug like Keflex um, and you're gonna use it and have them take it orally um, every single time it's self-administered or they're gonna do an inhalation in aerosol like albuterol, um, it, it remains self-administered. Um, disregard the question. Do you see any issue with charging per use for the Dave robotic instruments? Most of them are good for 20. I don't. You have to have more of a compliance policy on how you're going to repurpose that. Um, also, is that instrument being depreciated in any way on your cost report? or on your balance sheet, your finances. So you need to look at that. But I don't think, Marie, can you put that back up? I kind of missed that one, it went too fast. So um, so I don't see any charging per use for that as a problem if it's a 10 to 20. But the question is, if it is a capital expenditure, it's likely a hospital asset and that asset equates to equipment and therefore the equipment charge should be in the price of the procedure that you use this for. So would you charge this separately? I would think not, but I would charge a, a portion of the 20 uses in each of the procedures. So put, say it costs you a thousand dollars and you're gonna do 10 of them. So for a hundred dollars on each of the of the ten procedures, and Marie, I think we're out of time. Is there anything we missed? Oh, there's one more. 
Uh, apologize to the link. It was not meant for my question, but thank you for that. I wanted to know if you see issues with ASC and bundling of services with the procedure. Um, I don't. Um, I don't see a lot of that because the ASCs usually do these procedures pretty routinely. <clears throat> and um, there is, with the ASC reimbursement system, there is bundling of supplies in certain proportion of that. Um, so I don't really worry about, but I do try to take an Excel spreadsheet and say, what are all the services that are here? And what is the ASC billing say I can bill for? So I start to get a per procedure look on this. Um, Uh, yes, the does Vitalware have resource to contact if we have any? Yes, absolutely. We have the content team and we have me. So absolutely, you can do that at any point in time. You just write it, Brian, if you're a Vitalware um, uh, customer, then just go ahead and write to me at my Vitalware email um, and we'll be able to get you on the right path. What kind of equipment cannot be charged separately? Can you please give examples? Uh, perfusion equipment, um, neuro monitoring, you can charge for the procedure, but not the equipment, um, things like that. Um, so anything that is actually got an asset tag on it from your hospital is considered equipment that they are depreciating. And if you charge and you're also getting depreciation, then you're double dipping. Um, will these documents be sent by email, CC, that, yeah, yes, absolutely, that's going to happen. So I appreciate your questions, your, in, your involvement today. I think this has been great. It leaves us open to a lot of discussion. I hope to see all of you at HAS, or HAS, uh, 2021. It's phenomenal presentations that you can there. You can pick and choose which one you go to, um, but it's a great opportunity for uh, exchanging and networking. So thank you very much for today, and I hope you have a great, great day. Marie, you want to close this out? Yeah, that sounds great. And just a reminder that the CEUs and link to the presentation um, and recording will be sent sometime by the end of today. And if you were chosen to win a free complimentary pass it has, you will be contacted by tomorrow, I would guess. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a great day, all. Bye-bye.